changing this kind of siloed approach where we do marketing, you do sales, and you know when, when we win a new customer, sales say it's all them, and marketing say it's all them, and they they you know they never agree. And actually, you know, from a marketing department's point of view, the way to do great account based marketing is to build relationships with the sales team and ask them about their their best customers, ask them why their customers are are the best customers, um, because that will then help you build better target lists. You're listening to the Client Catching Podcast, the show that uncovers how high-performing service-based business leaders are successfully navigating the ocean of complexity around growing their business. Now, as anyone with the talent and guts to start a business knows, it takes a lot more to grow one than just being great at what you do, and you can't do it alone. So this podcast will show you how other captains of their own ship, just like you, have found the right strategy to catch more clients, simplify everything, and transform their business. So if you're ready to do the same, then jump aboard and join me, Adam King, host and the captain at Think Like a Fish, and let's go fishing. Hey, it's Adam here, and thanks so much for tuning into the show today. Now, before we dive into the episode, I just wanted to let you know how you can get hold of a free copy of my book, Conversational Relationship Marketing, because inside you're going to find 10 golden rules for B2B and professional service firms that consistently create client sales opportunities and drives revenue growth. And you'll find out how to do all of that using professionalism, ethics, and good manners. So what you can do to get your free copy is go to the podcast gift page at thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash podcast gift. And when you get hold of the book, what you're going to discover is a simple strategy to ensure that you consistently have a full calendar of motivated and qualified ideal potential clients who want to discuss doing business with you. And what I'm literally doing is giving away the exact entire strategy that my clients pay thousands to implement with them. Not only that, I share throughout the book links to templates, frameworks and workbooks that you can use to actually implement this strategy and get results. And it's all for free, no strings attached. In fact, there isn't even an opt in. So please make sure you go and grab your copy on the podcast gift page at thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash podcast gift. And if you want to grab some of the other gifts and resources that I offer there, please help yourself. So I hope you go and get the book. I hope you read it. And more importantly, I hope you do something with it. And when you do, I'd love to get your feedback on the results that you've got. But until then, let's get to today's episode. Hello, welcome to the Client Catching Podcast. Now, I want you to imagine a world where you could start the sales process by selling directly to your best fit, highest value clients. There's no wasted time working to market and sell to unqualified leads who aren't the right fit for your business, meaning that you can move straight into the phases of engaging and delighting your perfect clients. That sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it really isn't. It's not a pipe dream because with account-based marketing, all of this is possible. When you follow an account-based marketing strategy, it allows you to align your marketing and your sales teams from the get-go to promote long-term business growth, delight clients, and boost revenue. But maybe you're asking yourself, well, what exactly is account-based marketing? Or maybe you sort of heard the term before, but you're not entirely sure what it means and if it's actually relevant to you and your business. And maybe you're then wondering, well, how do I actually apply it to achieve some of those benefits that I've just described? Well, The good news is my guest today is going to tell you exactly how to do it. Now, he's the CEO of Napier Group, a 7 million PR and marketing agency where he successfully uh, directed numerous major PR and marketing programs for a wide range of technology, uh, technology clients reaching over 30 European countries. Now, on top of that, he's also chair of the PRCR, uh, PRCA, I'm tripping over my words today, but hey, if you listen regularly, you know that I do that a bit. Uh, B2B group, and he is a visiting lecturer in the PR in PR at Southampton Solent University. Now, as a huge part of his success has come from a focus on account-based marketing, you're about to hear how to replicate some of this success from a practitioner with years of in-the-trench experience of using it to grow both his own and his clients' businesses. So I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome my guest onto the Client Catching Podcast, Mike Maynard. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on the podcast, Adam. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's good to talk. And um, 
Yeah, we've uh, we've had a bit of a, a conversation before, um, um, you know, leading up to this, and 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 uh, been covering what we can discuss on the show, and and account based marketing came up a number of times, but that's what I want to sort of focus the discussion on. But before we do that, why don't you sort of talk about what was it that sort of got you into what you're doing today? What, I'm sure you didn't grow up thinking that I'm going to run a marketing agency or anything like that. If you're anything like me, anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I grew up imagining I was going to play left back for Ipswich Town um, and uh, <laughs> never have got even close to doing that, even with Ipswich Town. So uh, my footballing skills let me down. I actually started my career as an engineer. Um, so I designed electronic systems for a, a number of companies. Um, and then I moved into technical support, um, which is a, a fairly typical route. And, and then from that, moved into marketing. And, and even when I was um, running European marketing for a semiconductor company, I had no intention of running my own agency. Um, but I got this opportunity to, um, to to actually buy the agency I was using, which I loved and I knew the people, um, and thought it was an opportunity that was too good to turn down. So there's no career plan, no, no you know, steps to make it there. It was kind of like, had an opportunity, thought, how hard can it be? And and went for it. Yeah, that's it's it's quite a common theme actually, um, that comes up a number of times on the show, is that a lot of people they get where they are, not necessarily because they've got this preconceived idea or plan that they've laid out in front of them that this is where I'm gonna be, etc. The the commonality I'm seeing between a lot of people that are achieving success in multiple different areas is they they see opportunity and they take action on it. And what you've just described there is that you saw an opportunity and you thought too good to be true and you took it up. Mm -hmm. And is is that something that you find has been a common thing throughout what you're what you do, not just getting to where you are, but seeing opportunity in marketplaces and 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 things that are happening that you're able to actually see that maybe nobody else does? Yeah, I, I mean I am a big believer in in trying to plan particularly for your business. Um, but at the same time, there's no way you can predict the future. Um, so I think, you know, to be a business owner, you've always got to be a little bit schizophrenic. You've got to have this kind of vision of where you're going and how you, you're going to get there. And then you've got to have this other half of your brain that's looking out for all these opportunities that appear um, or roadblocks that appear and, and either taking advantage or overcoming them. And, and it's a it's a different balancing act. It's very easy to be too opportunistic or too planned. Yeah, I I, I think there's... <sighs> There's, there's quite a lot there as well in that I love the way you sort of say schizophrenic. And, and I think that there is, I mean, me personally, as I, I covered a lot that, you know, I, I was diagnosed ADHD in my 30s and it suddenly explained an awful lot. And there's been a lot of people that I've brought on this podcast. There's been a lot of people that I talk to in general that actually when you get a little bit more personal and, and start talking about this sort of thing, it comes out. There's a lot of a number of entrepreneurs, people that run businesses out there that have something sort of slightly wired differently about them that causes them to be able to take advantage of opportunities that come in, in them or take what others may perceive as risk and actually just go full on and go straight into it. And there's there's you know catalogues of examples of very famous people with dyslexia, ADHD, all that kind of thing, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, all those kind of people that it's something in the entrepreneurial brain, I think that I, I refer to it sometimes as entrepreneurial ADHD, that um, you need to be able to, at times, really hyper-focus, but at the same time, not completely block out all of the distraction, not filter everything out because there could be a potential opportunity. But at the same time, it's really difficult sometimes because you might go, oh, that squirrel over there and get completely, you know, taken away from what you're actually trying to achieve. So yeah, I, I find that really interesting. Um, so I've just gone off on one of my ADHD tangents, so I'm <laughs> going to bring it back. Um, <laughs> um, so why don't you talk to us about um, this idea about account-based marketing and first of all, what it is? Sure. So, I mean, account-based marketing is no different in my view from ordinary good targeted marketing. Um, all you're trying to do is rather than when you target um, your normal marketing, you might be, for example, looking to place an advert in a publication or looking to target certain keywords on Google um, search ads. 
Um, with account-based marketing, you're looking to target particular companies and typically particular individuals or particular roles within those companies. And then that's all it is. It's not a, you know, some kind of, of black magic. It, it's absolutely great marketing that's targeting companies specifically. Yeah, because I think something if you've ever heard of account based marketing and and maybe you've thought about it maybe you thought well it might not be for me or i'm not too sure i completely understand or maybe i'm not necessarily looking at this from a, an account perspective i'm looking for individuals and all that kind of thing even at big companies and some people will get afraid of approaching big companies especially if you're maybe a smaller business you've got to remember that at each account at every level there are people involved so do you find that that is something that maybe puts people off when it comes to the term, I guess, account-based marketing? I think um, I think the thing that puts people off is the fact that they probably overcomplicate the, the you know the targeting of accounts, and I think they they do imagine that um, it's much more difficult than it actually is. And you can start account-based marketing very very sim- simply. Um, absolutely, you can go and spend huge amounts of money and time and effort on account-based marketing. And large companies do that because it, it, it great, generates great return. But you don't have to overcomplicate it. And I think that's that's the most important message is that, um, you know, yes, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a new term, but people feel it, it, it's somehow very different or very difficult. And it's just not. Yeah. And why would someone want to consider taking this approach or what what type of business would you need to be to get the most value from an account-based marketing approach? So typically it's, it's business to business companies, obviously, because you're targeting accounts, you're targeting businesses. It's not um, necessarily any different from some of the consumer companies targeting their biggest consumers. Um, but the, the whole idea of having decision-making units within the accounts and targeting influencers as well as decision-makers is it, it is really a business to business um, role. But once you get there, you know, it's anybody who cares about getting businesses to actually become customers or clients. Um, so, you know, we, we've got, um, you know, one company, for example, who makes baggage handling systems for airports. Um, and actually they make baggage handling systems for the biggest airports in the world. That That's really their niche. Um, and they're the largest guys in the world because they're the best. Um, so, they don't want to target everyone in aviation. They don't even want to target every airport. Their primary goal is to target those those big hub airports because that's where they get, um, you know, the big projects and the money from. Um, and, and, you know, it makes sense. And yes, when they're targeting these bigger companies, or these bigger airports, sometimes they'll also reach some of the, the middle size and smaller airports and there'll be smaller projects. Um, but really their sweet spot is, the, is these, these hub um, systems. So you can go from a company like that, where actually it's fairly obvious, through to you know an agency like Napier. Um, you know, for a start, our real speciality is talking to engineers. Um, you know, that's what we do, um, and so we need to find companies that sell to engineers first, because if they're not selling to engineers, they're probably not the right company for us. We're not going to do as good a job as someone else. Um, and then actually we, we have particular specializations in particular industries as well. So you then start narrowing down. Um, and interestingly, from the, the account-based marketing point of view, we also have some major clients where, frankly, we don't want conflicts of interest. I mean, our, our clients don't want it either. So again, there are, there are companies that we don't want to approach because from our point of view, we don't want to be put in a difficult situation where we've got two direct competitors as clients, because then, you know, whether or not there's any bias, it's very hard to show true independence and true commitment to to each of those companies. Yeah. And I guess, really, again, a lot of this comes down to the fundamentals. It comes down to understanding your ideal client, the type of um, person that you serve, the the problem that you solve and who you solve it for and who is most likely to buy and, and what stage they're at, at you know, in, in a buyer's journey or level of awareness or all that kind of thing. It's it's really sort of understanding who that person is. And I guess maybe there is a a slight nuance here in that you are almost sort of looking at the type of business first and then sort of really drilling down into the person within the account that would be the best person to be in contact with and, and opening discussions is, is is that something that you find is 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 a good starting point 
Yeah, I, I mean, you make a great point there, Adam, because it's not just about getting a list of accounts and going, right, we're going to market to them, it's going to be fine. Um, you do have to do your homework. You do have to understand the people, the personas that buy from you. You do have to understand the customer journey um, because otherwise, you know, yes, you might be targeting to particular accounts, but you're not targeting to the right people. So you're only getting part of that benefit. Um, so absolutely, you, you've got to do those marketing basics if you want to be effective with ABM. Yeah, sorry for anybody listening that was hoping for a magic magic <laughs> bullet or a secret hack. But um, as as we often cover on this show, uh, it, a lot of it comes down to the fundamentals and the and the basics and making sure that that is in place and that is um you know that is set in stone and, and that it's been well thought out. So, assuming people have got that and they've got a good um profile of of who they're going after and all that kind of thing how would you suggest somebody goes about either let's let's go with if if nobody's done an account-based marketing approach before how would they go about starting it so interestingly i think a lot of people have probably done some sort of account-based marketing even if they imagine they haven't because they've probably targeted particular companies so um the the way you go about it again comes back to understanding your customer um, and also having some sort of toolbox of, of things you can use. So, you know, to give you some examples um, of how you can use account-based marketing, I mean, perhaps the, the best known one um, might be uh, using LinkedIn. You know, it's, it's a great platform. It lets you target advertising to particular job roles in particular companies. So it's a dead easy account-based marketing kind of approach. And, and to be honest, for new uh, contact acquisition, it's great. Um, it works well. But equally, you know, sending postal direct mail could be account-based marketing if you focus it around a particular account. Um, where people have email databases, you might want to do something different for your top accounts, you know, give them more information, give them something special. That, that's account-based marketing. Um, you know, we do some account-based marketing where literally um, we'll put different footers on our emails depending on who we're sending the email to. Um, and so, for example, one of our major accounts might get exposed to some of the successes and some of the things that we've done either for them or for, for similar accounts. So really, the, the, the opportunities are huge. And it's about trying to work out how you can persuade those key people in the accounts um, to start talking to you, to start that sales conversation. Um, and, and as you say, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic tool. Um, you do have to work out who they are and what they're going to care about and how to reach them. Yeah. And having just sort of said there is no magic, magic bullet and, and magic tool, you, you've sort of dropped something there that um, I know that I think a lot of people are going to be maybe thinking, and that is you've just got to find them and then come up with the best way of starting that conversation. There might not be a magic bullet, but what in your experience have you found as some good ways to at least just open the conversation with the kind of people that you want to be able to have those conversations with? So I think there's there's really two areas that I'd start with um, if I was uh, if I was trying to start on account based marketing. Um, the first is direct mail or direct email. Um, direct mail is really hard now. I mean, you know, people are working from home because of COVID. Sending stuff to people's offices is very difficult. But when people are in the offices. Um, you know, sending direct mail, really interesting, exciting direct mail pieces. And I don't mean a postcard with, you know, please, please buy from us, Mr. Gus. We'd love to, to sell to you. I mean, we've seen all sorts of creative direct mail pieces and we've created our own as well. Um, in fact, there was uh, there was an incident that people won't let me forget at the agency where one day I came back and I was like, oh, we've won this client. I've done such a good job pitching this client and we've won. It's amazing. It's really good. And everyone was sat there going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then somebody said, you've not read his blog, have you? And I was like, what? And, and they said, yeah, yeah, we, we, we all read his blog because we knew you were coming back to tell us you'd won the client. And uh, in his blog, he said that um, actually we won the business because we sent him a really creative direct mail piece. Um, and we sent him a pebble from the beach with, you know, choose an agency that's just a stone's throw away from your, your business. And he felt that actually that mattered to him, that was relevant. Um, so any kind of direct mail that's focused and targeted makes sense. And then the other thing um, I would look at is LinkedIn. Um, and, and there is no magic bullet, but we have had situations where we've needed to do something for an account-based marketing campaign. We've run something on LinkedIn and it's magically worked for us. Um, we had one client who was, 
you know, unsure about whether they could make, um, w- frankly, whether they could target the right people in the companies they wanted to reach. Um, and uh, we said, you know, just try it, just try it. What, you know, what's your biggest problem? And, the, and their European um, sales director told us the biggest problem. Um, and within a week, we got a meeting through uh, advertising via LinkedIn. Um, it, it was complete luck. You know, it could have been a week, it could have been six months. Um, but sometimes it works. And when it works, it's brilliant. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to try different things and then use what works for you. You know, no two businesses will actually use the same mix of tactics. Yeah, hundred percent. And I love that example, like that, as you say, it's a creative one, that, that whole, um, you know, employ an agency that's just a stone's throw away. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful play on words and a lot of people, they do like to be able to work with a provider that is close by um not everyone some people like to you know wherever they are based they could be even international but some people they do like that personal touch to be able to meet someone when you're allowed for coffee see the white of the eyes and all that kind of thing so that's that's important and um yeah i've heard an awful lot of um interesting creative um examples of that from people sending uh you know finding out somebody's shoe size and then sending a uh a, a, an expensive shoe or trainer to the person and uh, with a note saying, uh, this is my attempt at getting the foot in the door and I'll give you the second one. Uh, you know, I'll give you the other foot um, <laughs> if we, uh, you know, if, if we can have a conversation. Um, you know, that's kind of cheesy, but, you know, it works, I guess. Um, yeah, those, those, those kind of things are just, I mean, that's just creativity. It's just thinking a little bit differently and maybe standing out a bit. And you know, I think it's, it's termed lumpy mail, isn't it? Um, because you can send it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a package that doesn't look normal and it's, um, priority delivered and all that kind of thing. And that gets through a gatekeeper as well, um, in general. But yeah, I love that. I love that approach. And, um, the whole thing with LinkedIn as well. Um, you know, that's my playground. That's where I like to, um, you know, sort of really apply my trade as it were. And, and a lot of people, when it comes to this kind of thing, they don't realize if they haven't got, say, the sales navigator um, version of LinkedIn, there is the ability to search accounts, not just individuals, where you don't have that on the free version of LinkedIn. And this is not a plug for, um, you know, sales navigator, um, you know, not affiliated, but the power of being able to do that, you can search accounts, find the account, go into that account and then search staff members and decision makers and all that kind of thing, build lists and all the rest of it. So it from the days gone by, it just makes it so, so much easier to at least know who it is that is, is inside a company, if nothing else. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, there's so many options. So how would you, how would you sort of go about thinking, right? Okay. If somebody has been doing say this, so we've already covered the idea of like, if we, if you hadn't started, but if somebody has been doing the whole account based marketing approach, what's one thing that you commonly see people doing that you think they should stop or a common mistake people when it comes to doing this whole account based marketing approach? I think it's like most, so generally account based marketing is driven digitally. Digital tools have really helped um, be able to target your market down and be very specific. So um, whether it's LinkedIn or whether you're doing CRM retargeting or anything else, um, it, it a large percentage tends to be digital. And the universal problem we see with people is they're chasing the wrong metrics. Um, and if you're running an account-based marketing campaign, it's going to either be sales meetings with the target companies or it's going to be new customers or new sales. Um, but so many people will go and chase, you know, email open rates or advert click-through rates. And, you know, for for me as an agency, you know, I I can run thousands of emails on or thousands of adverts on LinkedIn, you know, every week. I I can set it up to run it. Um, The reality is as an agency, we could probably take on two new clients a month maximum. Um, And we, we couldn't keep that up for a long period of time. So what we care about is is really working with the right clients. So we care about clients that obviously we can make money from, but ultimately also that are going to really benefit from what we do because that's how you get a long-term relationship. Um, And I can't translate that into a click-through rate. Um, You know, if if I look at my website, you know, there's there's something like, um, I I can't remember what the number is now, four and a half, five thousand visitors a month. You know, I only want one of those. 
I, I, I don't want the other, you know, 4,999. Um, and so the, these, the great thing about digital marketing is it gives you access to new tools, new techniques. But the terrible thing is this, this avalanche of statistics that are so precise, they look like they matter, but quite often they don't. Yeah, it's, um, you know, vanity metrics is often Absolutely, quoted as yeah. something. And, and I remember a little while ago, and I can't remember who um, I can attribute this to, but back when we used to say website hits, um, you know, it, it was described as how idiots track success. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's kind of, and, you know, depending on your business, obviously. But um, yeah, I think it's so important to think, let's be honest, the majority of people like us that work B2B with service providers, we don't need thousands and thousands of customers it would break our business we can only serve a certain amount that we go deep with and and all that kind of thing that we have a very specific type of client that we profile that we do all the basics and we know that they would value our service and actually we would enjoy working with them and we can the majority of the time because of the profile that you've created know that you can achieve the promise that you're making to that client so you don't need all of that. You know, you don't need a million followers on Instagram. You need to know a few key people in a few key companies that can open the doors and give you access to maybe more of that. And I think that brings to me what a lot of people, and it's one of the mistakes that I see a lot of people making, is that they actually, they stop looking at the most valuable asset in their business because they get distracted by a lot of this stuff, because that entrepreneurial ADHD goes off and that is their clients. And I guess that really, for me, sums up what account-based marketing is about. It's like, it's so much, it makes so much more sense to grow and nurture an existing client than it does to go out and try um, Instagram stories and ads and all the rest of it to try and, uh, you know, acquire a new one. It just doesn't make sense where you've got the existing relationship, the trust is there. You can go in and have that consultative approach whereby you're finding out new problems, you get new ideas for services that you can then take to your other accounts and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, it becomes a snowball and you, you can essentially, it's built on relationships. This entire industry is built on relationships. And is that your experience or have I sort of, um, oversimplified it a bit. Oh, I, I think you've made a, a super point there. And, and it's another great use of account-based marketing. So a lot of people think of marketing as, as customer acquisition, ultimately getting new customers into the business. But one of the great things about account-based marketing is you can target your own existing customers, your own existing clients, and you can do things that strengthens and grows and expands that relationship with them and ultimately will grow your business. Um, so again, it's the same approach. And we, you know, again, as an agency, we'll, we'll run campaigns on LinkedIn targeting specific clients. Um, or as I mentioned, you know, we, we have, um, you know, we have different email footers depending on where we're sending emails and we'll send emails to particular clients that highlight, you know, different things depending upon what they're interested in. It's just, you know, it's just about focused marketing. But the great thing about account-based marketing is it's every bit as powerful to your existing cu- uh, customers as it is to prospects. Yeah. And it brings, it brings a memory back actually. Um, back in my early, early career, um, when I was, a uh, um, a lot more fresh faced than I am these days, um, I was working for a, um, an IT, um, service provider. So they were a solutions provider. Um, and interesting story, the guy who owned it had bought it for like 50 grand a few years before I joined. And, it was just about to go public. I mean, put it this way, the guy came to work in a Lamborghini. It was a very, very <laughs> successful business, right? And that entire, so I was in, I came in as a very junior marketing person and all the rest of it. And the whole strategy was we only market into our clients. And I, and what I mean by that is it was relationship building marketing. It was let's provide you with information and visibility around what is happening in the relationship that you have with us. So their entire model is actually quite interesting in that it, they never work directly with the end client. They were always, they were effectively the outsourced department for, you know, department of work and pensions, Atos, IBM, all that kind of thing. They were the call centers and all that kind of stuff. So we never marketed to those. It was always into the actual um, client or the company or the account that owned the contract. Yeah. And that involved things from, 
you know, newsletters, we would interview and we would feature them to other people and all that kind of thing. We did a lot of hospitality, <laughs> a lot, a lot of hospitality, which was cool in my day. I used to get to go racing, um, you know, car racing and golf trips and everything. But, um, you know, those are just uh, examples of the things that you can do with account-based marketing once you have the approach dialed in. But that doesn't happen until you actually have that, I guess, I guess that base and that foundation of existing accounts that actually makes that part quite relevant. Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I suspect at the time it wasn't called account-based marketing internally. It was just called marketing. Um, but what you're describing, again, is a great focused account-based marketing program. Um, and, and it will look different for different companies. So um, if you work uh, a lot with, for example, you know, certain American companies that are very concerned about being seen to be ethical and they won't accept gifts, you know, a campaign around uh, hospitality could be a disaster. Um, you know, it could be an, an absolute uh, uh, complete disaster. But equally, um, you know, there are other industries where that's almost expected. Um, and so, yeah, it's understanding your customers and what they want um, and then building a program that that really fits with their, you know, what, what marketing they want to see. Mm. And is there a difference between account-based marketing and account-based selling? So I think the, the answer is it depends on your point of view. Um, in my opinion, yes, there is, because I see a difference between marketing and sales. Um, you know, is there overlap between the two? Absolutely. You know, um, and depending on the sort of business you've got, maybe there's a huge amount of overlap. We work with some e-commerce companies, um, for example, where, you know, the difference between selling and marketing is, is, is very, very hard because marketing is aiming to drive a sale. Um, but equally, you know, we work with, with companies that are selling hugely complex projects um, to, to customers. And there, you know, marketing is there to generate perceptions of our, of our client, um, to, to really get them top of mind and also get them to be the preferred supplier. But at the end of the day, marketing is never going to sell the product because you actually need a whole team of, you know, engineers and specialists to create a proposal that they can then go and sell to the client. And, and the difference between sales and marketing there is huge. So, you know, there's overlap, but, but I think, um, Typically, the marketing is around the way people perceive the business um, and the sales tends to be around actually closing that business. Um, but but it's, not, it, it's not always the same. It does vary from company to company. Yeah, and, and, and I like that answer because I, I think sometimes people do get muddied around the two. Um, yeah, people have different opinions of sales and marketing and, and it will vary from industry to industry and the importance and all the rest of it. But I think ultimately what your answer reveals there is the importance of if you're going to be actually taking this path and going down the account based, I guess, business growth path. Let's, let's be honest. It's not, you know, you can't necessarily separate the two. Sales and marketing have to work together. They have to be in yeah. constant communication to understand what it is. So that marketing. I, I have a similar sort of thought and definition. Marketing is there to start the conversation, which will lead to the sale. I, I think, and yeah, sale is yeah. to sort of you know take that. So it's kind of like, how do you then ensure that you are giving people the right stuff that will entice that conversation ultimately? And then when they're having that conversation, the salesperson is perceived and positioned as a true value provider rather than someone trying to, you know, flog their wares. And, and I, I don't know, that's that's kind of how I see things. I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, the, the point you made about sales and marketing having to work closely together um, is super important in this stage. Um, and it's about marketing and, and sales, you know, changing this kind of siloed approach where we do marketing, you do sales. And, you know, when, when we win a new customer, sales say it's all them and marketing say it's all them. And they, they you know, they never agree. And actually, you know, from a marketing department's point of view, the way to do great account-based marketing is to build relationships with the sales team and ask them about their, their best customers, ask them why their customers are, are the best customers, um, because that will then help you build better target lists. Um, and you mentioned um, Sales Navigator on, 
on LinkedIn, you know, quite often we see, um, you know, sales teams maybe building target lists using Sales Navigator and then marketing using perhaps LinkedIn advertising to go reach those people. Um, and, and when that happens, it, it's just magic because if you can get that trust from a salesperson, they'll be completely honest. And, and you know, I mentioned this, this one-off campaign that happened to work in a week. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, the, the director of, of uh, European sales said, my CEO wants to visit this customer and I can't get a meeting. I just need them to talk to me. And they're not returning phone calls. They're not returning emails, you know. And, and so we knew that the, the, the client had a great product for this company. And we just knew that they weren't taking the time. So it was about exposing them to the product. And, and as I say, we got lucky. It happened very quickly. They filled in an inquiry form and, and bingo, you know, the CEO's uh, visiting the company and, uh, you know, suddenly the European sales uh, director looks like a hero. Um, but it was, it was through him being prepared to say, I haven't been able to do this. I, you know, if you can do it, I, I will be really pleased. And um, sometimes that's hard for salespeople to admit where they're struggling, but when they can, you know, it's where where marketing can really have the biggest impact. Yeah. And sometimes it will require the marketing department to take that leadership role and go and ask those kind of questions. Who have you been trying to contact that you're not able to contact? And, you know, is there anything that you can give us in terms of intelligence, understanding mm-hmm. about this person or blah, 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 that we could potentially create something that could be an irresistible. Because if it, if it is literally that one person, that CEO, what do you know about them? Can we craft something like a lumpy mail that can get your foot in the door? Because if you've not been able to get their attention, we need to help you. But I find it ironic that sometimes marketing departments are the worst at marketing themselves internally and their capabilities and what they're actually able to do. And therefore, sales teams don't always see the value that they can bring. They sort of sit and wait because maybe that's what marketing is done a lot of it's kind of like well we put stuff out there and we wait and we kind of you know i've been in departments and i've run departments like that and it is you know i've been guilty of it in the past as well you sort of sit back and you go all right well i'm doing what i need to do and you know my targets are being hit etc which isn't always revenue based which i think is one of the key things align the objectives (laughs) from sales and marketing so it actually makes sense um but yeah there's that's a key thing. If you're if you're the, if you're a company that has both a sales and a marketing function, getting them to working together, I think has some of the biggest potential for growth. I'm not sure if that's been your experience. Absolutely, and I and I would say that it's usually the marketing department that's that's really at fault here, um, where there has been some um, degree of animosity or you know just lack of communication between sales and marketing. Um, it's quite often because the salespeople are talking to customers and not seeing any impact from marketing activities. And the marketing team is, um, you know, going away. And and as my son, who um, many years ago when he was six, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, Rob, who who was one of them, he said, yeah, yeah, his job is to play on the computer drawing pictures, isn't it? Um, and, and I actually think, you know, some salespeople say, well, yeah, you go to, you're, the, you're the pretty picture department marketing. And marketing doesn't, um, as, as a specialization, doesn't necessarily go to sales and say, no, 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 our job is to make your job easier. We, we're here to make you successful. Um, because ultimately, if the sales team's not successful, the company's not successful. Um, so I totally agree. I think I think there's a huge opportunity in terms of working together. And a lot of them are, are human problems rather than technical or logistical problems. It's It's, you know, just work together as a team. Yeah, I often describe it as it's kind of like trying to make cats and dogs live together in harmony. And, um, you know, sometimes you can, but you just have to actually have, I think it's important that you have um, a a senior leader that actually recognises this and almost acts as the mediator in between if you're needing to sort of change this approach that's maybe a cultural thing in the business. I think that takes a, a quite a lot of leadership from above to kind of sit the heads down and go, right, we need to sort this. And we need to work how we can actually get both of you working together. Or it could be one of the heads from one of those apartments that kind of bring this to the CEO's attention and say, look, I think we need we need someone to sort of step in and get us working together here. Just to mediate. We're not asking you to solve the problem. We're just asking you to sort of sit in the middle and make sure we don't tear each other to pieces. Um, <laughs> you know, it can kind of work like that. 
Yeah. I, and I think, you know, I, I mean, if you don't do that, there's only one way it goes, which is sales team say, we need leads. Marketing team throws a bunch of leads at the sales team. Sales team says, they're all terrible. Marketing team says, you don't follow them up properly. Nobody's benefiting from that. You know, it, it's just a waste of time. Um, and, and the truth is probably there's some terrible leads. There's some great leads in there. Um, but, you know, marketing doesn't really know they haven't asked how to filter the leads to get the right leads for the salespeople. And the sales team have not said, well, actually what we need is, is you know, contacts that are in this role or in these tech companies or, you know, who need a product within the next three months. Um, and, and because they're not talking, it, it just ends up being this, this petty argument over leads typically. Um, and, and leads are expensive. And to waste leads, which is what quite often happens, that, that's such a waste for, for both sides. Yeah, there's there's so much wasted opportunity in so many businesses in the leads that they have. Um, I think mm. it's it's scary, like the amount of wastage um, when it comes to that sort of thing. And, and and I guess if anyone's listening to this and thinking, well, I don't have a sales and a marketing team, it's just a few of us, or even if it's just me, um, I guess in a way you've got to kind of think, well, I've got to have this conversation with myself. It's almost like the devil and the angel on the shoulder, one sales, one marketing. And it's kind of like, right, you need to start talking to him over here and actually working, each, you know, working together because you know, you need to kind of, um, get this, get this working because it will have a massive, um, benefit because you need to actually take what you're learning from the sales calls and then put it back into your marketing. And in your marketing, you need to be able to, um, create points along that journey that you are pulling out information that a sales um, team or person can use. So even if you're not a larger company with these two separate departments, the mindset is the important thing. Um, and I think that if you're able to think along those lines and just think, what are some of the simple things that I can place in my client journey, which will pull out information and help me understand my client a little bit more that will be able to inform people or even myself when I'm having these sales conversations so that I know the objections they're going to have and we can overcome them earlier and all that kind of thing. It will make your job easier over time, especially when you're doing an account-based focus because you really get to know the actual company and the culture inside of it. So yeah, it's been a it's really, really interesting topic, this one. Um, and I'm glad we got to uh, deep dive into it. So um, thanks very much for being here and, and, and bringing just some of your experience. And you know, why don't you give a, a quick overview then of, of the kind of people that you work with and, and the problem that you solve for them before we uh, tell them where to go and find you? Sure. So um, I sort of alluded it to it earlier. We, we talk about um, the fact that we help people market B2B technology products um, or products and services. So crudely speaking, we sell to technical decision makers. Um, and that can be anyone um, from someone designing an airport through to someone designing uh, an electronic system, so electronics engineers, or people um, developing, um, for example, bakeries. Um, so someone designing a large bakery, needing to know what products um, they need to put in to make that bakery efficient. We, you know, we work with clients who sell those products. So it's all about that technical sell. Um, and, and, and that's really what we do. Okay. And um, where would somebody go to check you out? Where are you most? I'm going to assume LinkedIn is one, but um, get, why don't you sort of uh, tell us where the best place is yeah, to get hold of you? Absolutely. So so LinkedIn is uh, definitely the main place for me. I think like most people in business to business, um, it, it's the place where, where we all hang out. Um, you can come and um, uh, visit our website, which is uh, napierb2b.com. Um, and we've also uh, recently launched a new podcast, um, a new podcast, our first podcast. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're, we're learning. Um, if you want to uh, listen to some of the great mistakes you can make as you start your podcast journey, I think it's a great example of that. Um, you know, including the fact that I actually managed to delete um, our first interview that we ever did, so we had to redo it. Um, yeah, if, you, if you'd like that, we talk about B2B marketing and we, we talk pr predominantly to people who make tools. And it, it's just uh, B, uh, Marketing B2B Technology is the podcast. You can find that pretty much anywhere. Yeah, and um, likewise, if you want to uh, 
go back and listen to uh, mistakes of, of, of running podcasts and things that you've done wrong, feel free to go back to some of the earliest episodes of this show because I've made plenty. And I think that just shows, again, like your willingness to actually sort of put things out there, try it. The opportunity is there. Let's give it a go. And I think that is so important as well. Um, if you're thinking about this B2B um, account-based marketing approach, try not to overthink it. Just go out and start reaching out. Get yourself Sales Navigator. Go and have a look at the account search option or, um, you know, it's a 30 day free trial. If you've never tried it, just go and give it a go. See what you can do. Come up with ideas and, and I'm sure like reach out to either of us if you want some more ideas and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be glad to help. But, um, before I go, I have one more question, um, that, um, I need to ask you, which is, um, how would you feel about speed skating for Great Britain? Well, I, I've been waiting for a long time to get selected to uh, to race in the Great Britain speed skating squad. Um, it's my hobby. I, I absolutely love uh, speed skating. And uh, I can assure anyone listening to the podcast who's got ambitions of being a Great Britain speed skater, they're probably already ahead of me. Um, it's not going to happen. But yes, one day it would be nice. I do like to ask people, <laughs> what's, what's one question you wish somebody would ask but never have? And, and, and that was Mike's answer. So there you go. Somebody's asked you that question and, um, yeah, there you go. It's, um, <laughs> completely nothing to do, completely, totally nothing to do with business. But, you know, at the end of the day, we need to keep things light at times. And, uh, you know, sometimes B2B can seem a little bit uh, too serious. So let's, uh, yeah, change things up a little bit. So, um, anyway, if you are still listening to us after that, thank you ever so much for listening and um, for being here, for tuning into the show. Um, please do check out what Mike does. All the show, uh, all the links to all the things that he's described will be in the show notes. So please do check him out. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn with him, uh, Mike Maynard. And um, yeah, thanks ever much, so much for being here. And uh, Mike, also, thank you for being here. And all that's left to say is happy fishing. So there we go. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some great ideas and, and found it really valuable. And you've got some things that you can now go off and do in your own business to help grow your business and attract and catch more clients. And if you have found it valuable and you can think of just one other person that may find some of these ideas helpful and, and, and help them grow their business, please share it with them because they'll thank you for it. So also don't forget to grab a copy of my book, Conversational Relationship Marketing from the podcast gift page at thinklikeafish.co.uk forward slash podcast gift. And all that's really left with me to say is thank you ever so much for listening today. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there you could be listening to. You've chosen this one. And for that, I am truly, truly grateful. If you're a first time listener or a, or a long time listener and you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please make sure that you do because you'll get updated of the latest episodes every time they come out. And if, again, you are enjoying it, I'd really, really appreciate a honest rating review on Apple Podcasts. I read every single one personally, and they do really mean the world to me. And yes, they help others find the show. If you're able to do that, again, I massively, massively appreciate it. But until next time, happy fishing.